Good evening. Welcome to this IET Merseyside and Western Cheshire Local Network webinar. The webinar has been organised by the Local Networks Energy and Environment Group. I'm Rob McDonald. I'm the chair of the group and I'm the IET host for this webinar. Next slide, please, Christy. The Merseyside and Western Cheshire Local Network is in the northwest of England and covers a large geographic area with a large engineering and technology base with some great universities and colleges that do engineering and science subjects. The, the map shows the local network area on the mainland, but the local network area also includes the Isle of Man. Next slide, please. The IET Mesoid and Western Cheshire Local Network uh, Energy and Environment Group promotes energy, engineering and technology in the important energy and environment subject areas. And almost as the days go by, that becomes more important. You just have to read the newspapers or the web. The group organizes webinars, face-to-face uh, -face lectures and events, and technical visits in our area. Next slide, please, Kristen. We have a webinar event coming up on the 10th of November with Simon Wood, Head of Projects NI at Zenobi. We'll talk about a 100 megawatt uh, battery project that's been installed in, in, in Cape Nurse in Cheshire. And on the 17th of November, we have a face to face lecture, the first one in a long time, giving an overview of Rolls Royce's small modular nuclear reactor power stations. The lecture will be given by Alan Woods, Strategy and Business Director at Rolls Royce SMR. Bookings for both events will be online via the IET events web pages. Next slide, please, Christine. This, e this evening's webinar will be given by Mr. Christian Pyro, Sales Manager Synchronous Condensers at ABBAB. Christian will be speaking to us this evening from Sweden. Next slide, please. Christian will speak for around four to 50 minutes with a Q&A session after Christian's presentation. Please submit your questions via the Q&A box on the Zoom screen. Uh, if you would like to have a copy, if you'd like to have a CPD certificate for the event, please write to me um, at my email address, robert.mcdonald at ietvolunteer.org. I'll put my email address on the chat box for you, so don't worry, you can't write it down. And as we, as I said, this, this uh, webinar will be recorded, and we'll post the video of the recording on our YouTube channel, the um, IE team may say Western Chester YouTube channel in about a week from now. Uh, I'd now like Christian to start his presentation. Over you, to you, Christian. Hello, Christian Payal. Uh, thank you to be with you. Uh, the topic, as I said, is uh, integration of 100% uh, renewables, the way on 100% renewables. How can we do that? And how synchronous condensers can, can help in doing that. Uh, before, uh, maybe I should explain a little bit what is a synchronous condenser, how is it connected to the grid and where, uh, and what is the idea with that, and uh, that will be the, the, the task for today. So what is a synchronous condenser? Well, it's a rotating machine. You can see that on the, on the right and low picture, lower picture. Uh, and this rotating machine, it's not a generator because there is no driver connected to it. And it's not a motor because there is no load connected to it, like a, like a, a compressor or something like that. It's, it's a machine which is, once it's connected to the grid and synchronized to the grid, it provides the service what is requested from it. And that is providing inertia. This is rotating mass. It's helping uh, to damp uh, frequency variations. It's short circuit power, and that is needed to make our relay protections and protection system work and to handle power qualities so that they are not, power quality emissions are going to go, not getting too high. And MVRs, uh, that means reactive power, which helps in voltage regulation and uh, power factor correction. Now you could say that, well, uh, this technology is not very new. It's an old, you can say, a reborn technology. That was the way how we regulated the voltage in the 50s. So why don't we use power electronics now? 
Well, the reason behind that is when we are now integrating more and more renewables like solar and wind, these type of uh, renewables are, we call it non synchronous. That means they are not directly to connected to the grid providing inertia in the same way as a, a generative or a, a fault current contribution. They are always interfaced with power electronics. And this is creating the problem, uh, which means that the grid is suffering of this fault current and this inertia, which I would call it system strengths. So the grid are suffering system strengths, and that's the reason why the synchronous are coming back. System strengths is something which synchronous condensers are good, good at. So how is that synchronous machine then uh, connected to the grid? Uh, well, what we need from, from the ABP solution is that we are using a small pony motor with a frequency drive, and we are spinning up the synchronous machine up to its uh, uh, synchronous speed, which is in, in the most cases in Europe, it's four pole machines running with uh, 1500 RPMs. And then we are purely are synchronizing that machine uh, to, to the network above. This could be via a step up transformer or it could be directly connected to the grid depending on the voltage level where the synchronous condenser should be connected to. Uh, of course, when you, once you have done this uh, synchronization of the machine, uh, then the machine would be ready uh, to providing the service. Now, uh, you see there, there is something which is called excitation system and control system for that. And that is necessary to, if we want to provide reactive power, we must change the excitation, excitation of our machine. That means the magnetization of the machine to be able to control the reactive power. And for that, uh, we need a, a excitation system. Uh, and uh, in our case, we are using a permanent magnet generator and providing the auxiliary power for that excitation system. So we are not depending on the, on the system voltage. But once the machine, the synchronous condenser is connected, it's fit for fight. It provides inertia when it, there is a frequency variation or uh, it provides fault current if there is a fault in the grid. And it can provide MVRs depending on the voltage regulation. Now, as I said before, what is the driver for this change to, to synchronous condensers? Well, uh, it's purely the fact that uh, more and more renewable generation uh, power plants based on wind and solar are connected. And with that, the total amount of rotating mass in our power system is reduced. And this is, means that you will get less inertia, you will get less fault current uh, contribution. That means a lower fault level. And the result of that is that you have a weaker grid. Uh, and this is done because of the fact that terminal power plants and in many places also nuclear power plants are decommissioned. And the old power, power generators, which provided this type of natural services or ancillary services, as we call it, are decommissioned and not connected anymore. And somebody must take over this responsibility. Uh, of course, sometimes uh, we try to do that also with power electronics, but I will explain it. it will, uh, I will speak about it. It's not such simple. Also on the industry side, where we before had a lot of ro rotating machines connected, those machines and motors are nowadays connected via frequency drives. And again, then those machines cannot provide the inertia to the grid and the, those machines cannot provide fault current. And this will be limited via this uh, voltage source, uh, variable speed drives, the power electronics of those. So the consequence in a weak grid is that you will get a deeper voltage dip in case you have a, a, a fault or a, a lightning strike on an overhead line, for example. And of course, this is a problem uh, for, for all loads. It's a problem for the system operator uh, because that could lead to a voltage instability and uh, to a blackout in the worst case. I think 
uh, Great Britain, UK had a had a problem on that uh, two years back in time, where these lightning strikes uh, in, uh, in the England area were relating to a effect where uh, many have experienced the blackout, uh, which happened after that. Now, when you have also a weaker grid and less rotating machines connected, there will be a bigger chance that you will get frequency variations because there is no rotating mass there which is stamping that out. And of course, when you have uh, bigger frequency variations, one on one side, the frequency variations are caused by maybe a variation in the wind and solar. But on the other side, it's also caused by, by uh, loads. We are changing more and more loads, which are dynamically. And this also makes uh, these uh, frequency variations becoming bigger when we have less rotating masses connected. In the worst case, this could re lead to a very big rate of change of frequency, which even can make uh, bigger power generators to trip, as they are not, they were not designed for a bigger uh, frequency variation. Uh, when it comes to fault level, we have the, the problematic the, the same, and that is that uh, all the relay protections used in the medium voltage network, in the high voltage networks, most of those are working on a on a current uh, which is triggering these protections. Now, if this fault current cannot be provided because this power electronics uh, are damping or, or uh, not allowing that high fault current which is provided, then this relates to, to problems. Uh, one of the problems is that, for example, power electronics devices even by themselves can be, get difficulties with the control functionalities as they work with something which is called phase lock loop control, which is very much depending on the voltage stability. And voltage stability is related to the fault level. So the solution for that, of course, are is uh, uh, synchronous condensers, it's, which is a known technology and we have, has, which has been used for decades. Uh, it could be also that if you retrofit a, 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 a turbo generator, an existing machine to a synchronous condenser, but this could be quite costly and sometimes even not possible, and at least very often not feasible from the financial point of view. And also then there are the new technologies coming in, like uh, grid forming power electronics devices, uh, with even combined, for example, with energy storage systems. And of course, they can provide some part of the inertia. But I will come back to that also. Uh, it's not such simple uh, to provide a, a, a inertia similar to that what a, a rotating machine is providing. Even that there are projects on game where we where they want to apply uh, virtual synchronous machines algorithms in power electronics, but it's uh, as I said not so simple and it's in the big scale it's difficult to be arranged. So if you go to inertia, now a, a rotating machine or a synchronous machine in our case, like synchronous generators, they are electromechanically connected to the grid. You see the grid here as a, a kind of mechanical axle. And if there is a change in, in active power, that means that maybe the demand is higher than the, the, the supply, then the frequency will drop down. Or in the other way, if the, if the supply is getting bigger than the demand, then you will have an over frequency. And all these variations are, are damped out because the machine itself as I said, it's electromechanically connected. So if there is a, a frequency drop, the rotating machine still wants to run on the speed it had before. And of course, then it acts as a generator and providing megawatt seconds to the grid. And with that, it's damping the, the frequency change. And also it's damping the other way around if their frequency is going too high. Uh, he wants to, to, to keep the slower speed, and then, of course, it's consuming megawatt seconds or inertia from the grid. And this is done, as I said, electromechanically. And in this case, you can say you don't need any type of al uh, control algorithms to do that. Now, if you go, uh, 
if you look on the right hand side, the inertia, the, the or what I call it instantaneous inertia or natural inertia from a rotating machine is is in direct relation to the rate of change of frequency. So that's the that's the reason why it is very important to provide inertia, uh, because otherwise you would get a bigger variation in frequency, which is uh, not of interest and it's uh, dangerous for a power system. Now, if we go to non-synchronous generation, like wind, solar, battery systems, then those uh, solutions are not electromechanically linked to the power system. They are linked via control systems. That means that you have to control the, the action of the power electronics in a very detailed way. And that means that it's depending on the control system. Where in the synchronous condenser or a synchronous machine, this is done electromechanically. You can say it's, it's a smart grid device because you don't need to control it. It's automatically done with based on physics. You need to do that controlled in the power electronics. And that's maybe simple if you have a, 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 a stable system. But if you have a fault in the grid, you may have harmonics, you may have uh, uh, phase jumps, you may have uh, big variations in frequency and even harmonics. And then it's not so easy to define what is now a frequency increase or what is a frequency decrease. So the, this, uh, these frequency changes can be very difficult to, to measure. And you measure, you must, uh, because otherwise you could not counteract uh, a frequency variation. When it comes to fault current, the fault current of a synchronous condenser that means the fault current which is delivered from the, the machine is depending on the reactances of the machine. So if the, and this is based on the subtransient reactance, this means this is the current which we are normally providing, which we call uh, during a, a peak current uh, uh, provided by the machine. Then we have the, the transient reactance and, the, and the, the steady state reactance and normal reactance, which is then, uh, uh, providing the fault current. And those fault currents are maybe five, six, maybe even seven times the rated current. And that is needed in the power systems to make it possible for power, power protection to, to trigger the, the power protection so that they can measure this fault current because many of the those protections are still working on a, on uh, on on the fault on the fault current value, that means if you have a higher fault current, the, the relay will protect more quicker. Uh, in the transmission system nowadays, there are impedance protection which are not depending on that. But uh, when you come down to regional and the medium voltage level, you need fault current because you cannot afford to put uh, uh, impedance protections down in a in a medium voltage network. For there, it's important that a fault current is provided. Now, this, the smaller picture on this slide shows the fault current of a power electronic device. Now, power electronics devices are normally designed after the rated current of the device. You would like to, yeah, what you deliver. For, if it doesn't matter if it's a wind or a solar rectifier or a, or a power electronics for a, for a battery storage system, uh, they normally designed for the rated current. Because if you design it for a five times bigger current, then this would be five times more expensive. So that's the reason why this fault current contribution from power electronics becomes very difficult and very non -act not, not economic, really. Uh, and the other thing is that this fault current must be controlled by the power within for the power electronics. So that means control algorithms must secure that the fault current provided of this power electronics device is limited and uh, controlled con continuously. Uh, you don't need to do that for a rotating machine. It's purely natural. Uh, the fault current of a rotating machine is depending on the distance to the fault and the impedance in between. So that means 
also there, a synchronous condenser is like a smart grid device. To have, you don't need to think about that, that you will get the full current you need. You will get it. Uh, it's more difficult when you have this uh, for inverter-based resources, as I said before. Now, when it comes to the third functionality of synchronous condensers, which means uh, the uh, production or the absorption of reactive power, which is used for voltage regulation, uh, this is done uh, by, by the excitation system. That means for that, we need a control functionality, uh, a control system which is controlling how much magnetization the machine is provided, is getting, and based on that, we are providing more or less reactive power or we are consuming or producing reactive power. Now, on the picture there, you see the, the, the glass of beer where you can understand the reactive power as the, fuel, the foam and then the active power would, could be the, the beer. Uh, or, now, when, when, you, when you look on a, on a machine, the, you, I have put there a capability diagram of a generator. You see that the Y axel uh, is blue, and that's the, 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 the axel on which the synchronous condenser is providing the reactive power. As a synchronous con condenser is not connected to a, a turbine, it's not be able to provide an uh, active power. It's not a generator, and that's the reason why we cannot act on the X axel. That means you cannot provide active power. But still, the, the capability diagram is showing the limits of the synchronous condenser because there are some limits which are related to the stator heating, to the rotor heating, uh, to the field forcing. And those limits are still physical limits for the rotating machines, which we have to consider. So that's the reason we still use the capability diagram. But the operation of the synchronous condenser is purely on the Y axle. That means if we are going overexcited, then we are providing a reactive power up to a, in this case, it's given in per unit, one, one per unit. Uh, this could be a machine, for example, which is, in this case, it was a 14, and 14 MVA machine, which means 14 MVR uh, are provided by that machine. And if you go down uh, on the, on the y-axle below zero, then we are absorbing reactive power. Uh, and uh, there again, the, the reactive power is then about uh, 0 0.6 per unit. Uh, that means uh, 0 0.6 times 14 uh, MVR could be then the, the reactive power which I is absorbed from the net. And if, if you absorb reactive power from the grid, you are reducing the voltage. If you produce and deliver uh, reactive power to the grid, then you are acting and increasing the voltage in the grid. Now, uh, what is the, the problems which different type of customers or players in the power market see when it comes to, to uh, grid stability? Now, I try to make there a, a little bit a table of which problematics different type of uh, operators and transmission system operators, distribution grid owners and industries are seeing. Uh, and of course, it's, it's related in many cases to the fault current, as you see for the renewables. If there's the fault current too little, you, you have limitations in, in, in uh, transporting the power from point A to point B. Uh, you have problems with the, your control stability of the of a wind turbine if there is no fault current and very low fault level, and the, based on that, the, the voltage variations are very big. And with that, the, the this phaser which is needed to to provide the control functionality is not stable enough, and then you will have difficulties with the security of the control system. Uh, for Transmission system operator, one of the big problems is, again, it's fault current. It's different type of power flows in different type of directions and stability of the grid. And stability of the grid is very much related to fault current and to frequency stability and voltage stability. And in 
all three cases, the synchronous condenser can provide support, which inertia, fault current, or MVRs. Uh, also, industries are becoming more and more uh, uh, need more and more support, especially those which are connected on the root end, for example, a mine, where in general, uh, when you have it connected uh, far away from the, the, the load center, then uh, the fault current out there is very weak. Uh, this could create big uh, problems when you would like to start a big machine or, or a big load uh, with big voltage variations. Again, synchronous condensers can help there in reducing uh, these voltage dips or of the inrush current or to providing a power factor correction. So synchronous condensers can play uh, a big role in all those cases uh, and uh, provides services to different type of players. So when, when we connect our synchronous condenser to the grid, where can we connect it? Well, if you have a renewable energy park, it could be good to connect the synchronous condenser to increase the fault level on the connection point. Uh, otherwise, maybe the impedance is too big to transfer power from your renewable site to the load center. Uh, it can help you in handling low, uh, low voltage drive through problematics, uh, which otherwise the, the, the converters uh, in the renewable plant needed to be uh, designed for. Uh, if you want to stabilize the grid, as the national grid ESO now are thinking to, to do, uh, you can uh, connect your synchronous condenser to a transmission system which is then helping in stabilizing not only the transmission network, but also the, the regional networks and the medium well networks uh, down in the distribution level. Uh, but sometimes even on the distribution level, there is a need for synchronous condensers. We, we, we have a lot of discussions with this uh, distributed uh, small microgrid cases where uh, uh, local uh, 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 municipalities would like to be self-sufficient. So if there is a problem with the grid so that they could disconnect from the grid and only provide uh, energy from batteries and uh, wind and solar. But even then, uh, they need a fault current to, to trip their medium voltage breakers and to secure that there is a fault current also in case you would like to be protected like so that your fuses are blown. Uh, when you need them, uh, when you need the fuses. I will speak now a few words of different type of approaches, how national uh, regulators are handling problems with low fault currents and low inertia values. Uh, the first one is national grid, ESO. Uh, they have... Uh, um, started a number of uh, processes uh, they call a project they call a stability pathfinder the first uh, project was uh, mainly focusing on inertia uh, in uk and uh, there the synchronous condensers were used to provide uh, inertia that means helping the frequency variations in the grid and that was uh, this project started for about two years ago. The first projects were purchased. Uh, the second stability pathfinder project, which is now, uh, they are now giving the contracts to, to those, as well as the third one for pathfinder three, are both focusing on uh, inertia as well as uh, fault current. Uh, but they also allow for uh, power electronics to participate. That means that they, they make this, uh, these uh, tenders uh, technical neutral. But what we have seen in those tenders is that the majority of those stability solutions uh, providing fault current and inertia are still based on synchronous condensers. So for ABP, that resulted, for example, in the first uh, Pathfinder, uh, project, uh, we got one contract from uh, uh, National Grid via a company called Stat, Stat, uh, Statcraft, 
uh, Norwegian uh, state-owned uh, renewable developer, the biggest one in Europe. And they are providing also ancillary services in different countries. Uh, and uh, they have in invested in these uh, synchronous condenser projects where we have delivered two of those. Uh, what you see in the middle, it's a synchronous condenser with a flywheel uh, and the pony motor. And uh, they were installed in this drive in Liber, uh, Liverpool. Uh, the right-hand picture shows uh, when we when we did our test for our synchronous condenser in our workshop here in, in Sweden to, to run up this uh, big machine with this big flywheel, uh, which is 460 megawatt seconds. It's quite a big amount of inertia and energy. So you have to really to secure that this energy is not uh, running away. So it's a very focus on auxiliary power supplies and uh, security. Uh, and that was delivered uh, about a half year ago, and uh, it's already providing uh, services to the to the to the market. Uh, in Australia, the, the way is such such that they have created renewable energy zones, uh, and within these renewable energy zones, these green dots. Uh, then the transmission system operator, the TSO, is responsible for grid stability. That means that they have to provide fault current and inertia. But if you, you like to connect the uh, energy park outside of these renewable zones, then you have to provide uh, your own inertia and fault current. And with that, uh, you need to secure that the, the system by adding additionally a wind or solar or energy park is not interfered negatively. That means in, in reality that you have to provide as much inertia and fault current as a similar rotating machine would deliver. Uh, an example of that was a, a developer, a British developer, which had one of the biggest solar farms in, in North South Wales, and we delivered two synchronous condensers. In this case, uh, uh, these were air-cooled machines and they were placed outdoors. You can see those machines and uh, the, the container, which is including the, the medium voltage, low voltage panels and uh, the, the protection and controls uh, panel. Uh, and in Spain, uh, the utility transmission system operator is requiring nowadays for each and every renewable energy park which is connected on a certain uh, connection point or not uh, to provide also full current uh, at that node. And uh, this means in reality that there are in future in each and every park you have to provide also a synchronous condenser so that you can provide this full current. Uh, it's not so much about the inertia, but it's mainly on fault current. But uh, based on the fact that you're providing a rotating machine, automatically you will also provide the inertia at that connection point. So the Spanish market is really booming, like the British one and, uh, and a number of other markets uh, going for synchronous condensers. So you can say one of the statements is that if you have a decentralized power generation, which means more wind, more solar, uh, distributed in the grid, you need also a decentralized system support. That means for voltage, we had that already. That means you do the voltage control in each voltage level. You don't do the voltage control only via the transmission system. It would not work out. You need to do the voltage control locally. And it's the same thing with fault, fault contribution. You need the fault contribution in the regional network, decentralized, as well as the inertia, uh, because then you will get a, a stable power system, which is allowing more renewables to connect and to, ha to have also a, a supply security, which is good enough. Uh, other reasons for decentralization is, for example, if you have a very big, unit, doesn't matter if this is a synchronous condenser or a generator, uh, sometimes you, you have a blackout, like you had in UK uh, two years ago. 
And then you have to restart your system again. And of course, if you have only big machines doing that, then you will need a lot of energy which those machines need because they have no load losses even when they are connected. Uh, and those no load losses of these rotating machines, you must deliver from somewhere else to be able to, to build up the grid again. So this is more simpler with smaller, smaller units than with bigger units. Now, this example is from a, a US organization, which is very a lot, working a lot with uh, this type of approach. Uh, working as it's a governmental organization showing that the super facts devices with synchronous condenser flywheel and grid forming batteries in combination could be a nice solution how to make uh, black starts. Another issue is that if we now get more and more uh, controllable devices in the grid, each wind farm, each battery storage system, each solar system, uh, and also rotating machines are controlling the voltage. Now, power electronics are very quick in controlling, which is nice to have, but sometimes it's also creating a problem because then they can hunt each other and create phenomena like that, which uh, National Grid saw in August 2021, where in Northern Scotland, uh, the, the 400 kV uh, voltage was increased to 430 kV within a few seconds. And uh, they didn't know because that was an interaction of control systems which created these uh, oscillations of, of uh, reactive power, uh, which created this high, too high voltage. And that is, of course, a problem, more a problem for power electronic devices than for rotating machines because rotating machines are much lower and are damping out uh, by by more by nature this type of power oscillations. And the other problem, which is to, uh, we are more and more relying on HVDC links between countries and also within the country. On the right hand side, you see the number of HVDC links installed in Europe already, and the, the blue ones are the HVDC links which are planned. And of course, uh, more and more, when we are linking together the market, then also we are more and more depending that these links are acting and are available. Now, uh, we don't want to speak about that and we don't want to see it sometimes, but uh, we have seen that in, in, the, in the Baltics, uh, Baltic Sea, we had this uh, explosion on this Nord Stream gas pipeline, which created a quite a big impact on, on gas supplies uh, to, to Germany. Uh, as this was interrupted from, from one moment to another. So this theoretically could also happen for HVDC links. So it's a, a risk which now power systems operators and, uh, and government are thinking about uh, because you cannot supervise all those cables which are put and lying on the ground in the sea. In the sea. So if you look on the synchronous condenser, it depends on the rotating machine. This is the big blue chunk in the middle, maybe with a flywheel. And then we have the pony motor to start and to run up the machine. Of course, when the machine is connected, we will have a losses, which is about one, one and a half percent of the machine rating. Uh, and those losses must be cooled away. So therefore you need a kind of cooling system like I, you see it here, it's a water-cooled machine in this case. And uh, you see the, a pumping unit and these uh, air cooler units, which are cooling down the machine, especially regarding the losses, the, the no-load losses, but also during the, when we are providing reactive power to the grid, then of course, we are also increasing the losses and those losses must be uh, cooled away. Uh, of course, we need lubrication because when we have rotating machines, we have bearings and those bearings need greased, need to be greased or lubricated. Uh, and of course, we need also a control system, uh, both uh, for the machine and to, for, for the excitation system, as well as to, for the protection of the machine and monitoring of the machine. And uh, also the, the start system for the, for the, for the pony motor, which is a, 
uh, variable speed drive. Then, of course, we need medium voltage because in most cases, uh, those uh, synchronous condensers are connected to a medium voltage grid uh, via a breaker and then maybe by a step up transformer f further up in the, in the network. So, here on the pictures, you see one of those installations in Australia. Uh, this was for, for a wind park where we had a, a water cooled machine. You see the left hand side. Uh, it was 14 MV MVRs, and uh, you see the, the machine and the, the small box in front is the permanent magnet generator. Uh, in the middle picture left, you see the, the fin fan coolers and the pumping unit, which is handling the cooling water. And then more to right, you see the main terminal box where you connect your cables, where you do the measurements, voltage and current measurements. Uh, for that machine, and you see the pony motor and the coupling, and this yellow part is a coupling guard so that you don't uh, get hurt if you, uh, so that the rotating part is uh, protected. And the most right side, you have the lubrication system uh, for this uh, uh, synchronous condenser. Uh, another example here, again, this is a bigger machine, you see here on the single line diagram. Uh, those synchronous condensers were via step up transformer connected to a 275 kV grid. Uh, this was uh, there to provide both inertia, which in this case for, we could provide uh, around uh, 100 m megawatt seconds inertia and about uh, 60 MVR reactive power, and uh, fault current in the range of uh, 300 m MVA on the on the on the primary side of the uh, step up transformer. Uh, the next picture, this is a machine you saw that before. This was where the cooling is not done with water cooling. In here, we are using a, a heat exchanger, which is mounted on air to air heat exchanger, which is mounted on the top of the machine. Uh, by blowing uh, cold air through the, the heat exchanger and the cooling down the machine. It's this is very compact and uh, a little maybe a little bit more noisy than the water cooled machine, but uh, in general, a very compact solution. Uh, also here, you can also build synchronous condensers, of course, indoor. Uh, in reality, we don't need to because we use our machines on oil platforms or on. As you saw before in, in Australia, in a quite dusty area without any problems. But if you have, for example, like here in Canada, minus 40 degrees, it's an advantage uh, to build the machine indoor so that in this case that you can use the cooling water and then you have only the fin fan coolers outside. And you have then a possibility also to make service for the machines in a controlled environment. Uh, so that was uh, based on a, on a water cooled machine. Another project in Canada where we brought in the air from outside into the machine directly. We call that duct in, duct out cooling. Uh, there, where it's the cooling directly integrated in the uh, building uh, so that you can then provide the right amount of cooling air uh, to, to the machine. Again, you see the pony motor on the right hand side and, and the, the loop lubrication system. Now, when we speak of high inertia system, in our case for ABB, we have developed a, a flywheel, which is integrating also a kind of protection so that we can be secure that this energy in the flywheel, which in reality is a disc, uh, rotating. Uh, is cannot, even in the worst cases, cannot uh, come outside or damage something outside of this uh, flywheel arrangement. And uh, based on that fact that we have this flywheel and, uh, and the machine, we can in increase the inertia of this combination uh, quite a lot. Uh, so you could compare that to a, a 300 MVA machine without flywheel. And of course, when you have then a smaller machine, 
like a 70 MVA machine with a flywheel, the losses are much lower uh, than for a 300 MVA machine. Uh, the installation is more simpler because you have smaller units which you have to place out. Transportation is more simpler. So it's uh, all around, it's, uh, it's a uh, competitive solution against these big machines. Uh, yeah. Another solution is that we can have, of course, also multiple units. Uh, as I said before, for this Lister Drive project, we had two units connected via its rewinding transformer, very similar as shown here uh, on the picture, uh, providing two times 460 megawatt seconds. So it's, it's a quite big amount of uh, uh, inertia, uh, which uh, you can already define in 0.5% of the total inertia in, in, of UK. So it's uh, quite uh, important uh, uh, inertia value, just provided by two, two machines with a flywheel. Uh, another solution which we have seen more and more, which will be discussed, is to combining synchronous condensers with power electro electronics. This was a project also for UK uh, in in Nilestone, where uh, uh, ABB provided a synchronous condenser system together with the Statcom, a voltage source converter. Uh, now you see on this slide, the voltage source converter was about plus minus seventy, and the the condenser was uh, 70 MVRs as well. So it's about the same size from, from the MVRs which can be provided from the machine. Uh, but now I will show you the picture of the installation. Uh, on the right, right picture, you see two buildings. The, the big building is the Statcom. The smaller building, the smaller arrangement is the synchronous condenser. So synchronous condensers are very compact in providing reactive power. That is what I want to show with that. Uh, now, what was the reason why we tried to combine this technology? Well, in reality, it's the, well, it was the same idea as this slide I showed before about Blackstart, where you combine uh, batteries and, and storage system to start up. In this case, the, the Startcom would be right, a possibility of damping over voltages and the possibility of doing active filtering and the rotating machine, the synchron will provide fault current and inertia. So that's it's a way of how two different technologies can work together uh, to, to, to bring the best for the, for the power system. So I'm very soon will end my presentation, a few slides. So as I said before, synchronous contents provide rotating inertia to the grid, like a smart grid device without control functionality is needed. It provides a uh, fault current for uh, grid strengths, also there without uh, control functionality is needed. This is purely done based on the react answers of the machine. And then it can provide MVRs for power factor correction or voltage control. And of course, for that, we need to control that uh, how much MVRs we shall provide or how we shall control the voltage. It has very good overload capacities, basically based on the fact that you have a, a chunk of tons which need to be heated up. So it's very simple to have a little bit more overload in the machine and to provide that as a reactive power. Uh, it's very good uh, uh, low, ride, low voltage ride through capabilities and it's supporting renewables in, in surviving in low voltage drive through problematics or cases. Now, another thing what is important is when you have a, a synchronous condenser and you have power systems, it's very often it's a discussion where you must do a kind of a simulation uh, in respect to stability. And there it's very important, this type of models which we have available, these models can be provided uh, for free from ABB for these type of simulations so that you can run your tests for a project. I think that is very important because it's uh, one of the problems today we see is this possibility to, to check what will be the real uh, issue if you connect more or less renewables to a defined grid point. Uh, 
there will be much, much more simulations and modulations required in the future. And that's the reason why it's important to provide models for these type of simulations. And we are providing, pro, uh, prepared to providing that. Uh, as I said, Power Factory, PSCAD, PSSE uh, models are available uh, for that. If you want a few words about retrofit, uh, when you have a rotating machine, uh, a generator which has run a number of years, and uh, you think that you it's maybe it's running in a cold fired. Uh, power plant, uh, which is decommissioned, then you could say that I could use this machine for for as a synchronous condenser. Yes, it's correct. You can do it, but first you have to do your homework. One of the important things in a rotating machine is the insulation system of the of the stator windings, <coughs> and if this insulation, which is of course during years of operation, each over voltage which ap appears in the network will influence this insulation and will, will age this insulation. So if you have a rotating machine where the lifetime of this insulation system is not very long, then I can say, frankly, the, the financial aspect will mean that it is not feasible in transferring a generator, an old generator with a bad insulation system. Uh, into a condenser. It will not work many years. So that's the reason why we are offering this leap uh, analysis, life expectation analysis for your generators or for your machines. And when you have done that, then you can go to the next step because then you know the lifetime of this insulation of the machine. Then you can check up if it's possible to use uh, the existing cooling system because very often the cooling system is integrated between the the, for example, a gas turbine and the, and the, the generator. Uh, you can look if the, the lubrication system can be used, and then you have to, to do the, a change, maybe add a pony motor or to add uh, uh, additionally uh, uh, a drive to start up this uh, synchronous machine. Uh, so it means that you have to have a starting system uh, and then most likely you would need to change the, the protection and control system so that you are uh... Hello Christine, just to say that um, your screen is frozen at the moment. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Christian, you're on mute at the moment. I can see you again, but you're on mute. Now, I can hear you. Hear me again. Okay, okay, good. Uh, will you read the questions, or shall I take it up from the from the uh, yeah, I'll take chat chat window? Well, maybe we can look through the questions together and then we can answer them. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, so we just want to start to the top. We, we've got uh, 39 questions and maybe some duplicates. Yeah. So we just start from the top and work down and, and see Good. If, if there's a duplicate, we'll uh, skip it. Yeah. Uh, do synchronous condenser have a role in phase balancing? ensuring that all three phases are approximately equally loaded. Well, on one thing, uh, it's uh, the synchronous condenser, as you have a neutral, neutral point, uh, all three phases will come together. And of course, then uh, there will be a, a, a current flow in the neutral point there. Uh, but we cannot control 
each phase. So for example, if there would be a need to voltage control one phase, we cannot do that with the synchronous condenser. Uh, but as the uh, as the synchronous condenser has a neutral point, we we act as a sink, you can say, for for harmonics or 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 also for for unbalances. Uh, next question: Hi, I have regarding converting existing old generators. So, is there any continuity parameter that would deem it? I think that was quite as clear said, in the presentation. Uh, I think you've covered that at the end. I think very I covered that. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Then assume a synchronous condenser are not supplying that net power into the grid. How would they make money in the UK energy? Well, it's uh, today uh, national grid is paying per the service uh, which the ancillary power supplier uh, gets uh, for for the service he's providing. That means that a synchronous, if a synchronous condenser is connected to the grid, providing fault current as a defined level and providing reactive power and inertia on a defined level, then they would get paid per half an hour. And these are hot tenders, which are handled as for these uh, pathfinders, stability pathfinder projects, which are open tenders. Everybody, or everybody, all those players who would like to participate can quote. And then National Grid ESO is selecting the, the, the right uh, uh, and uh, com best commercially uh, feasible solution uh, for them. Uh, how efficient is the best, are the best synchronous condensers? Well, normally we speak about 1%, 1.5% 1 losses uh, when we are providing the most of the reactive power. That means that if you run fully overexcited, uh, they must consume some energy. What is the typical efficiency factor? Well, I said, this is about this one and a half percent of uh, of losses you could assume. For example, for a seventy MVR unit, we have about eight hundred to nine hundred kilowatts, which we are consuming from the grid when we provide seventy MVRs to the grid. Uh, as a rotating machine in SC is also used a megawatt of real power. At times of inertia, it may be provide or absorb active power. How is the real power paid for? Okay, I think I, I explained that already. Yes, yeah. Uh, how does uh, adding sufficient... Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, how does adding sufficient... Uh, uh, Sufficient SCs and storage that are to provide a like for like stable grid comparison affect the overall costs. Well, in reality, that is something which is uh, uh, a little bit tricky because this, as I said before, this is a market. And the market, uh, which is handled by a national grid ESO, so, and finally, those costs for which national grid ESO has will be transferred then to the to the user uh, in the grid. Uh, of course, if there is more uh, ancillary service needed, of course, this will increase then also, of course, also indirectly the, the energy bill for, for the, the British consumers. May I ask a question for grid, power grid, but not really to do with infrastructure. No. We are strongly encouraged now to put uh, Uh, solar cells on the mustard roofs and panel from power pack. Does this very granularly distribute the rate of power into the grid? Can achieve anything useful? Uh, does it mean that power station wind farms need generate less power to meet all grid needs? Yes, uh, the domestic solar power simple lost perhaps. I said no. It's really influencing uh, also the frequency. You remember this uh, this uh, picture which I had where I had on one side this the demand. On the other side, I had the supply. Uh, you, when you have solar, uh, first of all, the, the, when you have solar, solar on your roof of your house, you will only deliver the overshooting amount of power into the grid. You will consume already some of this power inside of your own house, which means that the demand for national grid in general is becoming less. 
That means because you are then not anymore a, a, a load uh, for them. Uh, and all the additional uh, active power which you're delivering to the grid, you are helping uh, other suppliers so that they don't need to, to produce so much. So in that respect, uh, you are supporting definitely the grid uh, in, in active power, but mainly you will not really help in, in the stability issues. You may even if influence a little bit negatively in their frequency variations because you will then also be a, a cloud over your roof with also then a, a little bit at least, micro little, uh, influence the frequency. Uh, yeah. Has an, an increase in the UK installed synchrotron's capacity been observed? No. Yes, uh, there are, I think, uh, 2020, there were orders of, I think, six or seven synchronous condensers uh, where we delivered two. Uh, now, there are in the Pathfinder number two, there are again a number of seven, eight synchronous, big synchronous condensers connected. And also for Pathfinder number three, we expect. Uh, a number of 10 synchronous condensers connected to the grid. So this is uh, clearly a, a market which is increasing uh, in uh, UK, not only in UK, but in general. The slide mentioned synchronous and there's a significant negative sequence short circuit current component. What is the implication of this? Uh, thank you. Uh, there is one thing which is a, a, a synchronous condenser is providing, and that is a, a DC component. Uh, as it, it acts normally as a, as a, as a generator. But uh, this, of course, is a, a, a little bit a negative thing uh, because you have then to handle that via the circuit breaker when, when it wants to, uh, uh, to make sure that the circuit breaker which you add there is able to to trip that away if you would like to trip that away. Uh, on the other side, of course, the trans step up transformer needs to, to handle that as well, so that is not going uh, into uh, saturation. Uh, when it comes to negative sequence uh, currents in general, you can say you have also the negative sequence currents which are coming out from the grid down to them to the rotating machine. That means that we are uh, working as a sink for negative sequence currents. Uh, which is in reality good for the national, for the grid itself, uh, because otherwise this there is no thing available. Uh, you would need to create this type of uh, uh, thing for negative sequence current somewhere else. So in this case, uh, the synchronous condenser is a more positive impact. What potential effects can condensers have on peak TRVs and RF for fault? Circuit with fault interruptions on network load. As I said, uh, transient recovery voltages uh, I don't think that there is, of course, uh, um, I, I have to think that through a little bit more. Normally, I don't see that there is an issue with transient recovery voltages. Uh, there is uh, of course, when you have, let's say that you have a, a voltage dip, a fault, that after the fault is cleared, there is, of course, a rotating machine providing a, a portion of over voltage just after the fault. And that was, for example, one of the cases for this uh, combination of synchronous condenser with Statcom, where the Statcom could be there and damping away this over voltage, which was created by the synchronous condenser after the fault. Uh, so uh, I, I would think that's the re one of the reasons why this combination of battery storage converters together with uh, uh, asynchronous condensers could be a, a nice solution. Regarding the, the RRV uh, for fault, circuit breaker fault interruptions, I have to think that through. I have the answer not here just now. If you excuse me, maybe we can do that via mail or via uh, a, a written questionnaire. Uh, have you used uh, synchronous condensers with railway networks? I think there we have to, to differentiate a little bit. Some in some countries, the railway networks and uh, completely separate from the from the transmission network, uh, as they have their own power supplies. 
there it could make some sense uh, where you have your railway networks connected via substations to the national grid substation. Then, of course, if the national grid uh, substations reduce, reduce their fault level in their grid, this may have also an impact on the, on the uh, stability in the railroad network. But uh, so far, I have not seen any application where we use the uh, uh, synchronous condensers for railway networks. Can existing rotating generator that are on spin reserve be used simply to provide? Yes, the answer is yes, they can. They Christian, can. can I ask you a question? Yeah. You've spoken now solidly for over an hour. How are you doing? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you for me, it's brilliantly, uh, but uh, you know, at, at some point, we, we're not there to exhaust you. No, 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 no. I, for me, it's fine. If uh, I can go through a few more questions and then, uh, there is no, uh, there is no time limit, but just, just for your own personal well-being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. My personal well-being is fine. I have here my glass of water, and I, I feel quite comfortable. Um, yeah, once running, how much power would a 40, 46 megawatt seconds in international condenser pull from the grid to keep it spinning? Uh, as I said before, it's, it's about uh, 950 kilowatts. Uh, if we provide uh, a lot of reactive power as well, normally I would say during, if we don't provide reactive power, that we will consume about uh, 600 kilowatts. Uh, the next question, on a large grid such as UK, if there are no condensers, then what is the minimum proportion of total power generation that would come from initial sources in order for the grid to be sufficient stable? Um, I, I'm not sure if I can answer that question, but I, I, I can do like that. If you take away all the rotating machines, which are like coal and gas turbines, as we don't use, them anymore because of the CO2 reduction requirements. Uh, if you then also take away some of the nuclear power plants because they are decommissioned, then I would say it doesn't matter how much uh, wind and solar you connect. Uh, you would need a lot more uh, uh, hydropower stations uh, or, or geothermal power stations, which are still running with uh, synchronous generators. Uh, otherwise, you will not survive the grid. You would need uh, rotating machines like synchronous containers. Uh, the same issue for small grid. We had just a reason, uh, a 100% renewable connection on the islands of Faroe Island, uh, where we had an island with eight, 8 megawatt, uh, which is 100% supplied by wind with a small battery storage system and the synchronous condenser on. They are running 100% renewable just now. So also small grids, uh, there it's even more uh, important that you have a fault current uh, source available like a synchronous condenser. Does the flywheel rotate at the frequency of the A's or is it? No, it's running directly with uh, on the synchronous speed. We don't use gearboxes uh, for that. Uh, it's running directly uh, with uh, 1,500 RPMs. Why do you have a separate flywheel when you could just incorporate the mass in the main condenser? Well, uh, if you just put in the mass in the main condenser, you could, these are doing, for example, the big machines are doing that uh, as part of their uh, copper winding or, or uh, rotor winding. Uh, but then you would also get more losses. If you say that you just add the mechanical mass in the, in the machine, that would also be possible. But then you have to take care of that you will also have a, a temperature uh, traveling around in these masses, which can create stresses on the bearings. Uh, so it's, sometimes it's not so simple just to adding a, a more mechanical mass on on the on the uh, rotor uh, because that was that influenced the bearings and then also influenced the, the critical speed 
of their machine, uh, and then with that critical speed is also influencing then the, the maintenance of the peering. So it also there, these type of things are influencing. Is Christian is the short circuit contribution level affected by the pre fault operation conditions, under excitation or uh, uh, versus over excitation for pre fault conditions? How much difference? Yes, there is. If the machine is runner running over excited then of course the 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 fault current will be able to kept on a longer period of time we are calling that uh, field forcing uh how much uh, that is in time well uh we normally provide diagrams which is showing which are showing the the uh this this curves how uh the, the fault current differ if we have a, a excitation system running fully uh, overexcited or not, or underexcited. So there, we, we provide that normally in curves. In percentage, how the diff, how much that is in difference, I I would I can't tell you now. I, I would be a, it would be a guess. How to decide the optimal location of the synchronous condenser? Well, that's not so easy always. Uh, it's uh, on one side, of course, you could say that if you have, for example, an industry and you have problems with deep voltage dips, you have problems with power quality, you are a mine owner, then you could say that, well, that's a typical nice application where you could put a synchronous condenser in strengthening up the grid and providing you with the, the, the full current contribution, which means that the dip will be not as deep. And it's providing you with the NVRs for your power factor correction. So, and also helping you by increasing the fault current, fault level, you also will reduce the power quality emissions because there's a relationship of fault level and power quality. Uh, as an example, if you increase the power, the fault level to the double, the harmonics will reduce to the half. So it's a direct relationship. Uh, uh, when it comes to the grid itself, it's very often uh, handled via via studies. Uh, you know uh, uh, that there are uh, consultants which could act as a as a consultant providing the the, the right solution, uh, considering that sometimes the the uh, transmission system operators are doing that by themselves, but for their ongoing uh, Pathfinder projects in reality, the national grid ESO is not looking into the exact location. They think that fault current contribution will help anyhow, and inertia doesn't matter where you provide it, it will also support the grid when it comes to frequency uh, variation damping. So it's a, uh, they are very open in just adding it. Uh, of course, there is, especially when it comes to fault current and when it comes to voltage variations, uh, that means NVRs, then you, sh you should have a, some understanding where you have a low fault current, there you have a bigger need, uh, where you have other type of resources of uh, NVRs, maybe you don't need additionally NVRs from the synchronous contention. Uh, how long? would the condenser keep freely spinning if it was disconnected from the grid? Well, our machine, this with, with 100 megawatt seconds inertia, would run about one hour. Uh, for our flywheel, where we have 460 megawatt seconds, this would run about seven hours uh, until it came to a standstill. Now, uh, this is also very much depending how we stop the machine. Uh, yeah, because we do this, we can also stop the machine via our our starting system. That's one thing, and we have, we have something which we call checking oil pumps, which makes the, the spinning very simple, so that you have have very little uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, there is very little damping on the on the rotating itself. You can say um, I lost a, a English word here, but uh, it's. Uh, one for 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 100 megawatt seconds uh, machine, uh, it would be one hour, and for 460 megawatt seconds, it would be about seven hours. Uh, if it is feasible and desirable to connect the UK to Iceland to use Iceland's geothermal power, well, 
I think also there, it, is, it would be an idea. I'm not so sure uh, how much, how many geothermal power plants they could have in Iceland before they may get problems in having too much power generation connected to the grid. Uh, but uh, for Yuki, I think it could be an, an advantage to get uh, this connection. Of course, it costs a lot of money because of the age with diesel link. And of course, you have to, as I said, this security issue again. So uh, just on relying on that, I would not do that. Uh, I would also have to have a kind of regional uh, security by uh, synchronous condensers or by, by other means. We hear the term synthetic inertia. Is that what wind turbines with power electronics are providing or is it something else? Yes, uh, uh, wind turbines with power electronics are providing something which is called synchronous inertia, uh, synthetic inertia. It's they are loaning a little bit something of this active power which they could take out from the, 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 the turbine and they could provide that and push it in. Uh, it, as I said, it's, it's controlled by power electronics, so it's not natural and also it must be measured. Uh, sometimes uh, you, 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 uh, when you have this synthetic inertia, power systems operators are defining uh, limits, uh, how quick you could provide inertia by, uh, or, or synthetic inertia. For example, in Ireland, in UK, there are limits for between 250 and 500 milliseconds. Because it's, as, it's, as, as I said before, during a fold, you, you don't know if, if this uh, frequency excursion which you get, it's really a, a frequency dip or it could be even a frequency increase because it's, this inertia values or the, is a kind of a, uh, influencing the curve. It's not a nice, drop down like a linear value downwards. Sometimes it's going ups and downs because there are interactions and, and um, movements in the power system. And this makes it not so easy to measure it, especially when you have a fault. So that's the reason why synthetic inertia sometimes it's very difficult to handle and cannot be provided uh, instantaneously, uh, even when the power of electronics would be re relatively quick. Uh, the other thing is that there is something which is called a virtual synchronous machine where power electronics try to copy a rotating machine. Uh, this is a little bit more equal and I think there we will see more in future uh, uh, power electronics providing and battery systems especially providing uh, inertia, something which is uh, called inertia, but it's not real instantaneous inertia. And as I said before, you need a control system and uh, you are depending on the control system. This is not needed for a synchronous machine. It's, uh, it's a smart, this, a synchronous machine is a smart grid device. You don't need to control the inertia. It's, it's given by heart. Uh, are synchronous sensors available for smaller units? Uh, yeah, we, the smallest units which we have provided so far is for three MVRs uh, for a microgrid application. Uh, and also for 10, 15 MBRs for, for uh, mining applications where you only need default current. I think uh, that's uh, possible. Uh, yeah. I don't, uh, I don't understand how the synchronous condensers work without the flywheel. You mentioned they are optional. Well, a synchronous condenser, as I said, it's a synchronous machine. Once the synchronous machine is connected to the grid, it spins with, based on the frequency with the grid. If then there is, uh, a, a, let's say, a frequency variation in the grid, then the frequency in the grid is decreasing while the rotating machine still spins on a, on a, on a speed which is higher than the frequency of the grid, which means that it, the machine is providing active power to the grid, which means that's called the inertia. And then when it comes to fault current, the same if there is a fault automatically as the machine is a part of the grid, also as a component, uh, the reactance of the machine and the distance to the fault will provide automatically the fault current. 
when the machine is synchronized to the grid and connected to the grid. Uh, you don't need a flywheel providing full current. You don't need a flywheel providing if you don't need a high amount of inertia. And for voltage control and MVR control, you don't need a flywheel. Is there modeling software that could be recommended to allow the integration of within the model? Uh, I said Power Factory. I said for, for RMS uh, simulations or PSSE as well, it's possible for modeling. Uh, for ENT simulation, that means transient simulations, you could, it's preferably PSCAD is used from transmission system operators. So that could be a three softwares. Uh, how many condensers will the UK probably need? I'm not sure. I think we will see maybe uh, 20 to 50. Have there been any projects to look at con converting existing? Yes, it has. We have uh, existing con converted uh, conventional generators. Or does it tend to be a old bespoke new building design? No, it, there is, there is, you should not forget that we could convert the existing machine. It can be a, a economic way of doing it. And also there is a, one of the important thing is that you have a grid connection and which means sometimes it could be difficult to get a new grid connection because you have all these requirements and this, uh, um, um, I don't know the word for it. Yeah, you have to ask for permission to connect. And this could be, there is a lot of, low, a lot of instances will make, have something to say on that. And maybe this too could take years. Uh, generators years ago were specified with minimum short circuit ratio 1.4. I think there there is a different thing. There is a, uh, there is something called short circuit ratio in a machine. Uh, this is a now uh, to explain that it will take a little bit too long time, but it's not the same as short circuit ratio, which means short circuit ratio on the grid, uh, where you would like to have a default level compared to a connection of a size of a power plant where you have a short circuit ratio of and maybe it should be three or higher to connect a new wind farm or a new power plant or, or a power electronic device, for example. Uh, this short circuit ratio is different. Uh, I, how much that is for synchronous condensers, uh, this is very much based on the design. Sometimes we overrate the machine, uh, which is influencing then this, this internal SCR ratio uh, for the synchronous condenser. I think we, we keep it on that level. Uh, cost comparison between Syncon and other reactive tools. Well, if you don't need dynamic reactive power, you can say a power cable, maybe it's a, it's a good provider of, of capacitive reactive power or a capacitor bank or a, a reactor, uh, a switched reactor. But of course, always when you have the switched devices, you can also create transients which makes it a little bit more tricky. So uh, for dynamic comparison, synchronous condensers are uh, very economical if you compare it, for example, with an SVC or a Statcom. Uh, based on the fact that if you calculate also the, the space requirements, then the Statcoms and the SVCs need much more space and with that respect, it's getting more expensive. Uh, synchronous condensers, AVP don't have synchronous condensers with brushes. Uh, we don't brushless design, uh, but there you could do synchronous condensers with brushes. Other suppliers do that. Uh, we don't do that because very often synchronous condensers are running on uh, reality no load current or very little MVRs, which means very low current over the brushes. And this means that that's not an idle state. Uh, brushes like current. Uh, if you have very low current, it is not good. Uh, so that's the reason why we decided to go for brushless design. How to size a synchronous condenser? Well, it's what are the how much inertia do you need? How much fault level do you need? How much MVRs for voltage regulation do you need? 
uh, based on that, uh, we designed the system for the point of connection. Yeah, they will consume auxiliary power. It just, for example, in this Lister Drive project, we had about 40 kilowatts of auxiliary power supplies needed. And then we have this machine, as I said before, we are consuming some uh, kilowatts from the, from the grid when we are connected. To what degree of physical occurrence does the pony motor flywheel seem to have to be aligned? Uh, well, there is, when you do the, I understand that, that, that you have to align the machine. And this is, uh, of course, an important work during the, during the installation. Uh, it's, uh, in reality, there is no big difference in, in, than if you do the alignment of a, of a generator with a turbine. Christian, it's just another rotating machine that needs to be well aligned, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Normally it's, it's, uh, but as it is separate units, it's uh, maybe you have to work a little bit with that when you do the installation. But in general, it's, it's uh, not a, a, a rocket science. <laughs> uh, I think we are more or less at the end. Uh... Christy, if you may, I suggest we stop at that because you've done a fantastic yeah, yeah. job. I think it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, um, it, it's been a tour de force how you can speak on this through your slides and actually well, take the questions on the fly. Um, it's most impressive. Uh, clearly, you've not been doing this for a few weeks. Uh, uh, vast amount of experience and knowledge. Well, it's, I have some grey hairs as well. <laughs> <laughs> I have no hair, as you can see. Um, I've, I think we should close there. I'm going to end the webinar now. Yep. I'm going to thank the attendees. We, we um, just to, to end on, we, we ended up with over 300 attendees. Very nice. Very so nice. I hope I could provide some information. Well, I, think uh, you, I, I think you did that with the venue. So, so it's, Thank you. Very much. I'm going to end the webinar now, uh, Christian, and I will write to you uh, a thank you email, as you would expect. Thank you very right. much. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night.